Hello. Hope and pray you're having a great day. Uh, I apologize for last week. I got so busy doing other things, I forgot it was Saturday. But I had a really good visit with some folks that I wanted to have time with, and I got so caught up with them that I didn't get caught up with y'all, and I apologize for that. But we're in John chapter 10. Week before last, we finished off John chapter 9. And earlier, uh, in John 7 and 8, we were at the Feast of Booths, which is in the autumn, uh, right after Yom Kippur, uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah. Uh, basically, it's a, it's a Jewish celebration uh, on the, the week following the Day of Atonement. And uh, now, uh, September, October, on our calendar, it, it fluctuates because of their leap year with the extra month of a, second Adar. But uh, we're going to now be, uh, it's going to tell us in verse 22, it's time for the Feast of Dedication, which we know today as Hanukkah in December. And so it's a couple months later, and uh, Jesus has a different message now in chapter 10. His message is on the fact that he is the most amazing and most needed shepherd we could ever imagine. And uh, we get the best shepherd ever. And so he's going to talk to us about that and give us some assurance that we desperately need. All right? But before we get into that, let's go to the Father in prayer. All right? Dearest, loving, heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us your son. Thank you for your compassion, willing to give your son, and his compassion, willing to give himself. Father, Help us live for you in such a way that we are willing to give ourselves to you and help us be willing to live for you in such a way that we are willing to give ourselves for others one minute at a time. In your son Jesus we pray, amen. Okay, like I said, we're in John chapter 10. If you have a Bible, please join us. We're living for Jesus. That's why we're here. That's why you weren't snatched up into heaven as soon as you were born in Christ because Jesus still wants to live on the earth. He just wants to look like you when he does it. He wants to live on the earth through us. So let's start in John 10. We're going to start in verse 1. It says, truly, truly, which in the Greek is amen, amen. Pay attention, pay attention. King James, verily, verily. Okay. I say unto you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man's a thief and a robber. You do not become a leader of God's people by your own brute strength and awkwardness, by your own cunning and craftiness. You become a leader of God's people because God makes you a leader of his people. So he says somebody that's trying to get on their own and they're going to make themselves the leader, that guy's a thief. That guy's robbing you of something that you don't want to be robbed of. And uh, usually it's your freedom. And so he says, you don't want that guy. You want the good shepherd, which he goes on to say. Look at verse 2. It says, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. See, Jesus is the one who invites us. We, when Protestantism got started, they... The only baptism they saw was sprinkling babies, and they knew that wasn't in, in with what the Word of God said. And so uh, they threw out the bathwater with a baby, and they decided baptism was an outward sign of an inward grace, even though that's not in the Bible. And so they said, you know, uh, we're going to and get we're going to get saved by inviting Jesus into our hearts as our Lord and Savior even though nobody in the Bible ever does that. Uh, you say, well, what about John Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, when he says, I stand at the door and knock? He said in verse 14, that was written to Christians. It wasn't a formula for how to be saved. It was a plea for people who had gotten away from God and had lukewarm hearts to come back and be fully devoted to God. But we've said it's a, it's a means of salvation. You can invite Jesus in your heart. But here, Jesus does the inviting. He calls his own sheep by name. In chapter 15, verse 16, he does the choosing. He says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. 
in Romans uh, 15, verse 7, he does the accepting. He says, accept one another as Christ accepted you. But humanism says, we, we people, we can get it done on our own. So we'll do the inviting and we'll do the choosing and we'll do the accepting. We'll say the sinner's prayer, but there's no sinner's prayer in the Bible. Well, we'll go to the mourner's bench and pray through and there's no mourner's bench in the Bible. Well, whatever our, you know, we, means that we've come up with, that we can get ourselves safe, all of those things have one thing in common. They're not a Bible. Nobody's ever told to say a sinner's prayer to be saved. No one's ever told to invite Jesus in their heart or choose Jesus or accept Jesus. They're told to surrender to Jesus. God opposes the proud, gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. That's what his little brother James said in James 4, verse 6 and 7. Jesus said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. He said that in Matthew 16, 24. He said it in Mark 8, 34. He said it in Luke 9, 23, and he added the word daily. Our job's to surrender to God. He's Lord. You're not. There's one throne on the there's one throne on your heart, and if you're sitting on it, there's no room for Jesus. You can't be in charge. My job is to surrender. Your job is to surrender. And because we have such an amazing sh uh, shepherd, we want to surrender to him. And so he says here, the gatekeeper opens to me. I'm the shepherd. Okay? Verse 4. It says, when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. How do you know the voice of Jesus? If your Bible's dusty or your phone app isn't used to, to read about Jesus, you don't know Jesus. Listen to his voice. Spend some time listening to Jesus talk. And you can do that as you read God's word, as you meditate on what Jesus says. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, start there. Start with a gospel and see Jesus. Christians, by definition, are Christ followers. We follow Christ. You can't follow him if you don't know where he goes. So follow him. We remember when, back in chapter 8, he says, if you abide in my word, then you're truly my disciples, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Okay? You've got to abide in his word. Spend some time in here. Be so amazed by Jesus that you want to spend the rest of your life following him. He's the good shepherd. There's no other shepherd that's good. He's the good shepherd. All the rest of us, we, we try to be shepherds. You know, my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, they were all shepherds in the body of Christ. They're all elders, pastors in the, in the body of Christ. You want to be one of those people that cares, but nobody does it perfectly. They all sin and fall short. But Jesus, he's the good shepherd. And he said so. Okay? So he says, he leads them out. Follow Jesus. He will lead you to where you can get the feed that you need spiritually, the nourishment you need. He will seek his own. He will bind them up. Remember, in, uh, both in Matthew and also in uh, Luke 15, uh, 1 through 7, Jesus is the good shepherd who looks for the sheep. Okay? And he keeps seeking the lost sheep until it's found. He brings it back and calls everyone together and rejoices. Well, here he says, I lead my own out. Okay? He leads them out. Uh, and they listen to my voice. They know his voice. Can you tell the difference between the voice of Jesus and somebody else? See, I've been, my wife and I, next month, well, later this month, in a couple of weeks, we will be married 51 years. Okay? Now, if you believe that, that's not faith in God. That's faith in Jack, because Jack told you that, right? If you want faith in God, you've got to get it from God, right? Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if you, get, I've got a magic coin trick I do with the kids and, and the coin disappears, okay? And I tell them, don't trust a preacher unless he gives you book, chapter, and verse. You want your faith to be in God, not in the preacher, okay? There's 33,000 and some different denominational headquarters different whole religious organizations in the United States of America now, okay? They can't all be right. We could all be wrong, but we can't all be right. Only Jesus is right. And so I'm a Christ follower. And every day I open my Bible, I need to be willing to let Jesus change me, okay? You need to be willing to let Jesus change you. He's the good shepherd. We le he leads us out. 
we hear his voice and we can tell the difference between his voice and somebody else's by practice. Have you listened to the voice of Jesus to such an extent that you recognize it? Okay. Verse 5. Okay. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. I can tell. When somebody comes up with some teaching, it's not in the Bible. My wife and I, we read through the Bible every year for like over 40 years. This year we're reading through it two and a half times. Okay? But as we read through the Bible, we, we, you find things that you didn't see last year because you're not the same person you were last year. All right? There's things you can see from God's Word that you didn't see last time you read through it because you're not the same person you were. God is moving in your life to do things differently than He did before. So you're a different person. And so the Word of God will more fully speak to you, but you have to know the difference between His Word and somebody else's. Oh, somebody told me I could, uh, you know, invite Jesus to my heart as my personal Savior. Where does it say that in the Bible? It's not in there. Somebody told me I could, you know, I could say a, a sinner's prayer and be, that's not in there. You, you can't find those things. Those are constructions of people who were unwilling to surrender to Christ. Okay, if you want to come to Christ, you deny yourself, you take up your cross and you follow him. Crosses are for dying on. And denying self, that's where it starts. And it starts there because in, in, in 2, P, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, he starts listing all these sins that people are going to have in the last days. First one on the list, lovers of selfies. Lovers of self, okay? I want, what, I want what's good for me. And so he buys self-help books, self-actualization, self-fulfillment, self-everything. And Jesus says, no, deny yourself. The best thing you can do for you is bless him. Blessing you to view is bless her. See, it's more blessed to give than to receive, right? Acts 20, verse 35. If I can live for Jesus and bless the lives of people around us, around me in his name, I'm so, I have so much more joy. But anyway, back here, he says, uh, they won't follow a stranger. They don't recognize his voice. You need to spend enough time in the word of God that you can tell the difference between the word of Jesus and the word of some preacher. Okay? Yes, I've been preaching 47 plus years. But your faith can't be in Jack. It has to be in Jesus. I can't get you to heaven. In 47 years, I haven't converted anybody. I bring him to Jesus. I let him convert him. Okay? You can catch the fish, but you have to let him clean them. <laughs> okay? Jesus is the one that cleans us. <clears throat> and so, uh, verse 6. He says, now, this figure of speech, Jesus being a shepherd, this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they didn't understand what he was saying to them. See, Jesus so often used figures of speech, used parables, but they didn't understand. And the reason they didn't understand, we find out in Mark 4, verses 10 through 12, is they didn't ask. They just, eh, I don't care. And if they didn't care enough to ask, they didn't find out the answer. Jesus in Matthew, uh, Matthew 7, verse 6 and 7, he says, ask, it'll be given unto you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. If you're not asking, if you're not seeking, if you're not finding, what, could Christi what would Christianity be worth if you could find it without looking for it? So after he tells the parable of the sower in, in Mark 4, uh, 1 through 9, it says they came up along with the twelve. So it's not just the 12, it's others who came up also. And they ask him what the parable meant. And he says, to you it's been given the answer. Everybody else just gets it in parables. So that seeing, they'll see and not perceive. Hearing, they'll hear and not understand. Lest they turn and be forgiven. I, I, I thought he wanted us to perceive. I thought he wanted us to understand. I thought he wanted us to turn and be forgiven. He does. But if you could do that without seeking, if you could find the joys of salvation and the joys of Christianity without searching, without seeking, what would it be worth? It wouldn't be worth anything. And so he says, you seek, you search, get your Bible, start in the gospel. Luke's the longest. I, think, I, I, I encourage people to start there. Mark's the shortest. It's tied with Luke for the most miracles. Find one and look at Jesus and take your time seeing Jesus. 
All right? So he says, uh, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So they didn't understand because they weren't seeking. Jesus continues in the next paragraph in verse 7. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, again, amen, amen. Pay attention, pay attention. Verily, verily, King James. He says, truly, truly, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. See, most sheepfolds, some of them were stone, some were wood, some were hedges, but mostly they were stone. A lot of rocks over there and you just make, make a sheepfold. And so the sheep would stay in there and he would protect them from wolves. I don't know if you remember back in, uh, in um, 1 Samuel 17, David, when he's going to fight Goliath and Saul doesn't think he's able to, he says, wait a minute, if a bear would come and attack the sheep, I'd kill the bear. If a lion would come and attack sheep, I'd kill the lion. That, that's what shepherds do. They risk their lives to save the sheep. Jesus says, I'm the gate. There's a sheepfold and there's a gap. And I sit in the gate. I'm the gate. I protect the sheep so that nothing comes in. Okay? Jesus protects us. I'm not protected by anyone like I am by Jesus. You aren't either. Not even your mama. Not even your daddy. No one can protect you like Jesus. He says, I'm the gate. I'm the way in. I'm the way out. Then he says in verse 8, he says, all who came before me... They're thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. Now, when he says that, he's at the temple. Here's all these priests. Here's all these Sadducees, Pharisees that are the teachers in all the, sen all the synagogues all across Israel and, in, and around Israel and other places where they can find a, a quorum of men to, enough to build a, 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 a synagogue. And, and so he says, everybody came before me that they said they were the leaders. They're not the leader. I'm the leader. They're thieves and robbers. They, they don't care. They want to enrich themselves. How many people have used religion to try to draw people after themselves? I don't even want to get into the list. You don't want to either. So he says, no, I'm the good shepherd. I have one savior. His name's Jesus. Okay? In Matthew, he says, don't be called rabbi. Don't be called master teacher. Don't be called father. Don't even be called good teacher, okay? He says, now, nah, Jesus is my Lord. I'm just Jack. I've been preaching 47 years. I'm just Jack. No titles. So he says, those other people, they're thieves and robbers. Don't, don't follow them. Then he says, uh, verse 9, I am the door. Anyone who enters by me will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. If I want to be fed... I want Jesus to feed me. You want Jesus to feed you? Spend some time here in his word. Abide in his word. John 8, 31 and 32. Then you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Abide in his word. Just spend time in there. Meditate. Just see Christ. That's our task. And if we do that, life gets so much better. So, you want pasture? Find him. Now, here's the verse we like. John 10, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. There's people out there who want to take advantage of you religiously. Don't follow them. Don't follow me. If you don't remember who I am, that's okay. If you haven't had your feet under my table, I haven't had my feet under your table, I don't care if you remember my name. I want you to know Jesus. So he says here, those guys, they can't do it for you. He, he's only there to, to, to take advantage of you. And people use religion to make themselves rich. And we know, and those people give Christianity such a bad name. But he says, I came so that you could have life and have it abundantly. The life I have in Christ, I could not have imagined without Jesus. The life you have in Christ, you can't imagine without Jesus. And so he says, I'm the good shepherd. I came so that you could have life, and not just life, have it abundantly. I have abundant life. See, the, the assurance I have available in Christ, I couldn't have imagined that outside of Christ. 
The brotherhood that I have in Christ, I couldn't have imagined that outside of Christ. The purpose I have in Christ, the assurance I have in Christ, there's so much that I have in Christ that's, there's no, it's not available anywhere else. It's not available any other way. How well, how closely do you follow this good shepherd? I just want to sit there and look at him. It was a song we used to have in our songbooks. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. Of all the things I want to see in heaven, pearly gates are nice, but that's not first on my list. Golden, the gold street, gold crystal clear like glass, which is pretty hard to find gold that way. That's not first on my list. You know what I want to see? I want to see his face. I just want to see Jesus. And when I do, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And down here, I want to say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I want to live better for you. And so he says, he came so we have life and have it abundantly. I don't know people who have life as abundantly as children of God. Don't have it. If I make a million dollars and my loved ones, my children, my grandchildren don't love Jesus, I'm a poor man. But if I can lead them to love Jesus by my example, I have wealth untold. And so he says, I came so you could have life and have it abundantly. I remember vividly when I was just a kid, my grandmother, who was like 60 years older than me, saying, who am I and what's my house that you've brought me this far? Quoting David. And why has God blessed us so richly? Not because we deserve it, but because he loves us so much. Verse 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The only reason I have assurance, the only reason I have salvation, the only reason I have a purpose, those, I'm in the body of Christ, is because he laid down his life for me. I, all of my righteous deeds, Isaiah 64, verse 6, it says they're like filthy rags. And you don't even want to do a word study on filthy rags because it's nasty, it's dirty. And then it tells us that we, we can't save ourselves. I, I can't do enough good things to get myself saved. But it says in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, it says, he made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He took our sin and we say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because when God sees you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees Christ's righteousness. We don't go, get, go to heaven because we're good enough because we're not good enough. We go to heaven because he's good enough and he gave us his righteousness. And so he says here in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So verse 12, it says, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not lay down his life for the sheep uh, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. Okay? Hey, I'm, I'm not going to lose my life to take care of these sheep. I'm, I'm out of here. i got to look out for number one. You're not number one. I'm not number one. The center of the universe is the person God puts in your path at any given moment in time because that's the only person God can use you to bless. And we're here to bless them. And the best thing I can do for me is bless him and bless her. And so he says, that guy is a thief. He's a robber. He can't give that to you. He won't lay down his life for you. He'll run away because he's going to look out for him, his own skin. Not number one, but what he thinks is number one. And the hired man who thinks he's number one, he runs away. Don't be that man. Don't be that woman. Don't run away. I need to surrender my life to bless the people around me. Not to give them what they want, but to help them find what they need. 
and they need the same shepherd that I needed. Amen? Amen. So, verse 14, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Okay? I, 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 last uh, Wednesday night in class, I said, okay, how many of you guys know uh, the name of Jimmy Carter's wife? Rosalind, okay. How many know the name of his brother? Uh, Billy, okay. Uh, can you name his daughter? Yeah, okay. Uh, what did he do before he was president? Well, he's governor. Uh, what was he before that? He was a peanut farmer, okay. I said, now, how many of you guys know Jimmy Carter? We don't know Jimmy Carter. We, we know a lot of stuff about him. We can know a lot of things about Jesus and not know him. Do you know Jesus? Would you recognize him in a crowd? Spiritually, can you hear his voice? Can you see his love? Can you, can you feel his compassion? Okay? He's Jesus. He says, I want you to get to know me. Because these others, they're not me. There's nobody out there religiously that compares with Jesus. There's no religion on earth that offers grace like we have in Christ. We have grace. I like to say G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. He gave his life so we could have grace. We don't deserve grace. By definition, if you deserve it, it's not grace. And so he says, I am the good. There's not two good shepherds. There's not three good shepherds. There's one good shepherd. His name's Jesus. The prophets were good. The apostles were good. Jesus is Jesus. There's nobody else like him. So, verse 15. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and lay down my life for the sheep. I don't know Jesus like the Father knows Jesus. You don't either. We will never attain to that. But we will get closer to that if we aim high than if we aim low. I want to know Jesus. I want to know Christ and the power of his rising. Paul says in Philippians 3, I just want to know Christ. I want to see Jesus. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. I just want to see Christ. I want to know, and I do that in, in the word of God. When I've got my Bible open and I'm in here looking, I see Jesus. Do you see him? Do you see the, com the compassion on his faith when he's hugging those little kids that they brought to him? Do you see the, his, his strength when he cleans out the temple? Do you see his love when he speaks to the people and the multitudes and in individuals? When he wakes up in a storm and says, peace be still to the sea. I want you to see Christ. He wants you to see Christ. He's the good shepherd. Okay, verse 16. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice. So there'll be one flock and one shepherd. Back in Ephesians 2, we find out later that Paul says, those of you who were the people of God, who were on the inside looking out, and those of you who were on the outside looking in, the Gentiles, he says, God wants to make you one in Christ, and he himself is our peace. And he broke down the dividing wall against us contained in ordinances and took it out of the way. In Colossians 2, it says he nailed it to the cross. We're not under that old law because the old Jewish law separated Jews and Gentiles. He says, no, I want you to just be one in Christ. Not this kind of Christian or that kind of Christian, just Christians. You know, 47 years ago, going through a minister's file in the hospital there, licking, uh, he says, uh, a guy says, are you a minister? I say, yeah, Jack Abels. He says, well, what religion are you? I say, well, I'm a Christian. He says, well, what kind of a Christian are you? I said, most of them are happy Christian. I just want to be a Christ follower. You just want to be a Christ follower. I have an amazing shepherd. I don't want another one. I just want him. I don't want to lock myself down to some bunch of teachings of a group of men that thought they were smarter than what God gave us in the word of God. I just want to follow Christ. Now, we're going to go on next week, starting in verse 17. But I want you to just see Christ and be amazed by the shepherd and follow him every step the rest of your life. I will try to do the same.
God bless.